Welcome to the Falmouth Chamber of Commerce. The Falmouth Chamber is dedicated to working on behalf of our members to make Falmouth a better place to live, work, and conduct business. We are committed to developing the economic, cultural, educational, and civic interests of our community and welcome the support from all organizations to achieve our combined goals. Whether you call Falmouth home, are a summer resident, or a visitor, we hope you take advantage of all that the Chamber has to offer. Good evening. I would like to call to order the meeting of the Falmouth Select Board. It is Monday, March 6, 2023. It is now 6.30 p.m. I would ask, please, that you silence your cell phones. And if anyone in the audience is video or audio recording this public meeting, please notify me as the chair. Okay, thank you. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we will go to public comment. Public comment may be made on routine matters not on the agenda this evening. Comments are limited to two minutes. Please introduce yourself. And since this matter is not included on our agenda, the select board will not participate in any discussion of your topic. It is not appropriate to use this public comment time to comment on any person's reputation, character, physical condition or mental health, disciplinary matters, or civil or criminal charges. Comments about job performance and decisions are permissible. Is there anyone here for public comment? Yes, sir. Please come up to the podium and introduce yourself. You have two minutes. Hi, Craig Martin, Precinct 9. A um, little wind blowing tonight because I'm just getting off of Chappaquoit Beach, which is the subject that I'm here for. Um, a, few, um, a few weeks ago, um, the board made a decision after listening to the Harbor Master's um, um, presentation. Um, to end all um, freedom of the dogs in BB Woods and or Chapa and Chappaquoit Beach. Um, whereas before there was discretion. If there was misbehavior, yeah, animal control would attend to it. But you were actually advertising for people to, um, to find a way to end this behavior, uh, which has been going on for decades. Um, the, the, the testimony, the presentation from the Harbor Master, a little disturbing to begin with, um, quote, um, the lawless, end of quote, uh, dogs running, um, running free, um, making it sound like an Alfred Hitchcock movie, The Dogs, a bands of wild dogs chasing the citizenry out of town. Um, it's, it was an unfair description, the lawless. I wish uh, that was exaggerated. Yes, dogs are free, and um, I, I'm hoping that the, this board has had a chance to read recent letters to the Enterprise. Um, and I'm going to do a shout out, don't know where, shout out to one of the um, writers, a Miss Plod from West Falmouth, who, said, who doesn't have dogs, but she invites her friends over, guests, house guests, to come down to Chappaquoit to go watch the dogs enjoying themselves. She says, it's amazing to see how the simple things in life um, are maxed out um, to enjoyment for the, for the most part by these dogs. She says, people have a lot to learn. Um, I've never had witnessed one bad experience in the decades of going to Chappaquoit and letting my dogs um, play with the other dogs. Um, same with B.B. Woods. This subject's been brought up in the past decades. Um, uh, we, we studied B.B. Woods a dozen years ago, and everything was decided. It works as it is. And uh, I'm, I'm asking for the board to reconsider. Yes, I have no doubt the Harbor Master has gotten some, as he said, some calls. There are some complainers, incessant, and I'm going to guess there are a few callers. Remind this board, before this board's time, we had our Heights resident um, that was t t torturing the selectmen with this subject and 
bullying people off the beaches with a stick. He was eventually sent to prison for six months. Yes, these people are out there that hate dogs, um, but the general public is, likes the system as it is. We only have some months in the winter, a February winter day. There's no reason why my dog shouldn't be able to go out and swim and get a stick. Not allowed to by law because he has to be on the leash that he can't go swimming. Um, my dog actually was bred to swim in the Atlantic Ocean, Portuguese water dog. Um, and it seems almost inhumane that I can't let him year round ever go swimming. Um, and the, Sir, the, your two minutes is up. Okay, okay, so I, I'm asking, I'm asking this, this board to, what I think was perhaps an impulsive decision, um, I'm asking this board to reconsider after reading the letters to the paper that recently, and, um, and, and not, not requesting to end the leash law. No, there should always be a leash law, um, but it should be enforced when, the, when a dog is irrational or misbehaving. So not asking here to, to end the leash law, just asking you to consider refraining from setting the animal control uh, on an aggressive trip. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. For your time. <laughs> okay, we will move on to the town manager, town manager's, do we have another? Do you have a public comment? I didn't see oh, any I'm hands so, I'm except. I'm sorry, my bad. I, I, I just, he called. was the only hand I saw. We will move on to the town manager's preliminary report. Thank you, Mr. Madam Johnson, Chair. Stop. It's okay. The first item on your agenda is to vote the warrant for a special town meeting for April 10th, 2023, uh, for the special town meeting that was discussed by the board and called by the board at your last meeting. Um, I do want to note that uh, the start time for that special town meeting is 7.15 p.m. Uh, and that is at the recommendation of the moderator in terms of coordinating the annual town meeting with the special town meeting. Uh, Mr. Vieira has indicated that he will open the annual town meeting, but then before beginning deliberations on Article 1, he will then open the special town meeting and we will take up the special before any of the articles for the annual. Um, so, <clears throat> as the board is aware, we have one article for the special town meeting, and that is to uh, amend the town position classification plan. The amendments are to add two new positions and to increase the pay grade for the existing diversity, equity, and inclusion position. The two new positions are the assistant superintendent of parks, forestry, and school grounds, and the sustainability coordinator. A copy of all three of these job descriptions will be posted on the town meeting page of the website prior to the precinct, prior to the beginning of precinct meetings. Um, and so that, that's the first item on your agenda tonight, and then that's immediately followed by a vote on the article recommendation for that one special town meeting warrant article, Article 1. There is a draft recommendation and explanation in your packet. Um, there is a, uh, a typo in the draft in your packet. This will be a recommendation of the select board and not the finance committee. The third item on your business agenda tonight is a presentation from the owner's project manager um, presenting on the report on the cost of the wastewater treatment facility improvement project. Um, this is a topic that the board has heard about before. Uh, Amy Lowell, our wastewater superintendent, he did give a presentation to the board on February 13th outlining this report prepared by Weston and Sampson, which is our consultant serving as the owner's project manager for this project. Um, however, a division of local services official has requested that the board receive a presentation directly from the owner's project manager addressing the reasons for the cost increase for the project as part of the process for the Division of Local Services determining whether a second ballot vote will be required to exempt the debt for this project from the limits of Prop 2 and a half. When this project was initially brought to town meeting in the spring of 2022, the project was only at the preliminary design stage. Uh, cost estimates at the preliminary design phase are inherently less accurate than estimates based on 100% design, uh, or better still, full construction documents. As we plan future construction projects that require debt exemption votes, 
I recommend that we require cost estimates based on 90% design so that we have a, so that we do not have a recurrence of a project being so far over budget. And then the last item on your business agenda is uh, to take a vote to accept the owner's project manager's report and to re-vote the a vote taken by the select board at that meeting on February 13th um, to authorize a, an application to the Division of Local Services for a determination of whether a second referendum is required due to the increase in cost for the wastewater treatment facility improvement project. And again, that's a clarification that was requested by the Division of Local Services. And then finally, you have one item on, a, on the consent agenda, which is a approval um, to the fire department is seeking approval to submit an application for an emergency management planning grant. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Johnson's job. We'll go on to vote to approve the warrant for the April 10, 2023 special town meeting. Conversation. Mr. Johnson Staub or among the board? <coughs> I'll just quite in order. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. To add that this be the warrant for the April 10th, 2023 special town meeting. Okay, I have a motion. Madam Chair, could I just clarify? I, I, the, um, thank you, Mr. Patterson. I, I think you've pretty much addressed pretty much addressed it, but um, for clarity, the, the board is voting to approve the warrant for the April 10, 2023 special town meeting as submitted. Thank you. Okay, so I have a motion. And a second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Number two, vote article recommendation for the April 10, 2023 special town meeting. So we're just looking for a recommendation on article one of the special town meeting. I, re I recommend article one as printed. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any further conversation amongst the board? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Presentation of the owner's, owner's project manager's report on the cost of the wastewater treatment facility improvements project, Weston and Sampson. Madam Chair, I'd like to declare that the uh, company I work for on a daily basis yeah. does do business with Weston and Sampson. Um, it's one of our many, many uh, vendors, so. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Um, I'm Kent Nichols with Weston and Sampson. Um, Thank you very much for getting our presentation loaded up. Uh, this is relatively short, uh, so certainly I'll run through it quickly, and if you have questions, uh, you can either stop me or uh, grab me at the end. Okay. Um, as uh, your town manager said, uh, your superintendent gave a presentation with a lot of detail a couple of weeks back. Um, we were asked to supplement that um, at the request of the state uh, to provide an additional part of the process um, as your own as project manager, we're intended to be impartial and give some advice directly to the town on behalf of the town. So we do our best to kind of watch over things in a, in a more general sense and from a big picture standpoint. Um, as such, we've been working uh, along with the town for a while now uh, to kind of help pay attention to the things that are going on during design. One of the roles we have taken is um, during the discussion of the project cost, we actually were brought in to come up with an independent project cost estimate. And that's part of what has been um, taking place that has gotten us to question the costs and kind of bring them back to where they've been to date. And so a good part of what we're gonna talk about is that cost information. So, um, so uh, we issued a report to the town on uh, February 14th. This report was uh, written in a letter format. It's relatively short. It specifically addresses the key issues that the state said that we should address. Um, in general, where we are now is uh, at the cost estimating point that was done back before your town meeting, there was an anticipation that the project cost for the treatment facility would be approximately $24 million. That was uh, successfully passed through town meeting and again, successfully passed town ballot vote. Subsequent to that, uh, 
in April of 2022, uh, after you pass that um, ballot vote, work continued on the design of the process. And as that work continued, more was known about the project that you were going to be doing. And that allows you to do, as you advance that design, that allows you to do better and better cost estimating. So it's not unusual that you had better information at a later time than you had, you had originally had when you started with the preliminary design. And so by the time we did the updated cost estimate in January of 2023, um, both the engineer, the design engineer, GHD, and our independent cost estimator put together updated costs. And they concurred that the cost was higher than that $24 million. Um, our independent cost estimate came in at approximately $33.5 million, as you have heard previously. The breakdown of that and the comparison of that uh, from a cost standpoint is pretty consistent. Uh, I believe uh, your sewer superintendent, Amy Lowell, uh, shared this information with you directly, but this is summarized in a letter from us. Um, it's clear from the comparison of these that the majority of the extra costs lie in uh, increases in the amount for the individual construction items. These are large and complex projects, and it's not unusual for those numbers to change, as I said, as you advance the design from preliminary to final. And in fact, that did indeed happen. Um, the goal of the cost estimate was to ensure that the town was prepared to, before you go to bid, prepared to have the right amount of financing in place. And as you know now, that's something that you need to supplement additionally. So, where we are right now is looking back and saying, okay, how much of a change has there been? One, we know that. We've, we've advised that it's approximately nine and a half million calls. And two, what was the reason for that change? And this is part of a significant part of the process that we want to talk a little bit about. Um, so there are a lot of factors that affect how costs come together. Um, in particular, I want to talk a little bit about estimated costs versus actual construction costs. There are a number of unprecedented things that have been happening in the industry over the past few years. Um, I believe our letter actually mentions the COVID pandemic, but it was only a very small part of the equation that factored this in. It, it kind of began a, a couple of different factors came into play as well. One of those was the general inflation of consumer goods. But the biggest impact on construction costs has been a change in the predictability of the market when it comes to large and heavy construction projects and the availability of contractors and their ability to actually put together the costs of the projects. And it's, it's pretty, un, it, as I said, it's, it's pretty unprecedented. Um, we had seen periods of good, strong inflation in the past. In the time I've been in the business about 35 years doing the same type of work, in the time I've been in business, I've seen steep inflation and shallow inflation curves. Um, there's been times when we felt construction costs were more predictable than others. And even at those times, it was always a bit of prognostication to try to estimate the cost of a project before it's ready for construction. A lot of that is because of the number of things that get settled, the refinement of the design details as you proceed with design. And as you get that number better and better, you can usually zero in on a number. Now, that changed drastically over the past couple of years. And the major factors at play here is the ability for contractors, who are the ones that have to bid your project, to be able to accurately predict, A, what their project costs would be, and B, what their risks are when they put a bid together. And that's a major part of the equation that we run into. That combined with other market factors, including the availability of labor, these unpredictability factors actually also reduced the number of qualified contractors that began to pursue projects. There was a limited number of contractors out there doing these types of projects. And because of that, we've actually seen a significant reduction in the number of qualified bidders significantly on bigger projects like this. About 10 years ago, I would expect to see maybe 10 bidders, um, certainly eight or more on really promising big projects, and now we just don't see that. And part of that is the market conditions that we've talked about. There is another factor that comes into play with Massachusetts projects, and that's that the complexity of the bid process in Massachusetts for vertical construction is, is actually fairly sophisticated because of the file sub-bid laws. And in this case, you've got a project that has somewhere on the order of a dozen file sub-bids required. 
And what that means is the general contractor who will assemble his bid isn't even the only one who is responsible for putting together the pricing that will come in that bid package. That contractor has to deal with some of the other factors that come into play, including all of these individual subcontractors that, that will end up submitting sub-bids and get accepted. And each of those contractors has their own kind of perception of the industry and risk that comes into play. So when you factor all of those um, kind of risk and reward decisions by the individual contractors into play, it makes for a very unpredictable situation in the bidding atmosphere. Um, and I guess I'd, I'd point out a, um, a couple of, I think we shared some examples of this in, in our um, letter. We shared the example of the Mashpee project that was bid and significantly right around when you were putting your estimate together shortly thereafter, and the bids came in much higher, similar to what your estimates were. Very similar type of project, easy, easy to see. Recently, and I think a really good way to underscore this as an example is recently I bid a project in Northern Rhode Island that was extremely easy to um, estimate the amount of work. It was basically some masonry work on a cylindrical tank that needed to be redone. It was easy for the contractors to look, ascertain the, the scope of the work, and pretty easy for them to estimate what their material costs were, and by the way, materials that weren't at great risk in the industry right now, things that you can get readily like brick and mortar. And it was easy for them to estimate their labor. We received two bids. One bid was just under the engineer's estimate at shortly, just short of a couple hundred thousand dollars. The second bid, and this is a strict masonry contract, was more than three times the first bid. In a lot of cases, and this happens consistently in our Massachusetts bidding, in a lot of cases, these types of bids result in very wide fluctuations for individual pieces and components. And as I said, this would be a file subbidder example for your project. If that first bidder wasn't in there or maybe made a mistake in their estimate or made a mistake in their paperwork, you could very easily be subjected to that wide of a swing of some of that subbid work. And that tends to trickle up with some of these additional bid situations. What we've seen recently is a very consistent pattern of that happening job to job where one or two of the file subbidders will come in fairly high. And it's hard to track. And it makes it even harder for the general contractors to kind of get a handle on what they're going to be doing for the specifics of the work. The resultant is we have an industry where project costs are very hard to predict, and the only thing you can do is to build in a little extra factor safety. The market has an unpredictable amount of cost resistance to this ability to bid. We can't properly estimate that. It's not accounting. It's, it's a bit of, as I said, it's a bit of prognostication. We're predicting the future when we're doing estimates. And for that matter, we just try to make sure we've got the right number. And I think that the new estimate does that really well for your project. Um, the other part of the equation that we want to talk a little bit about, though, is that the changes in your co project cost were not due to changes in scope. When I say that you've refined the design, the vision that was adopted for town meeting was to create a treatment plant that had the capacity to deal with the future sewer expansion that you need to do in the, in the, in the known areas. We know very well that that's a certain amount of treatment that has to happen at the plant. That scope didn't change. And this is one of the key factors of our report to you, is the scope stayed the same. It's the same now as it was then. It's just it's been refined a little bit so we know more about what the details are. But that's a key element in you making a decision as to whether you had to go back to the voters. Because if you were to make a major change in the scope, it would make sense that you would go back and ask for the decision to be made again. In this case, you didn't change the scope. And we're very, very, very confident. Um, there is a lot of work to do with the plant, but the scope remains the same. Um, certain other things have taken place as we did this. One of them is people recognized that the cost was going up. Um, the project team worked pretty hard with the, with the town staff as well to talk about ways to mitigate those costs. And so there were some activities, and we've put these in the letter to you too. There were some activities that came into play where we tried to get our hands around what ways could we kind of wrestle that cost back down and kind of keep it under control so that you wouldn't be exposed to as much cost as, as maybe otherwise would be controllable. Um, and I think the project team did a pretty good job of doing that. Um, that doesn't, again, necessarily mean we've 
we've changed the nature of the work. It's just we've tried to do things to make it more cost effective. At the end of the day, I think it's pretty clear you just need more money to affect the same project. Sure. Um, yeah. Yes. Does, does that, those calculations encompass the normal uh, um, change order process? I mean, has that all been factored in already? Norm that you go through on a regular Yeah, and, and site normal like is that. part of the reason for, for doing this. We do see a, a pretty broad change. One of the most common things that's been happening in the industry is unpredictability of equipment uh, shipping. So when contractors put their price together for their bid, they assume they can get equipment in a certain amount of time. If they can't get that in a certain amount of time, things happen. I'm talking about the elimination of being wrong on your bid and then change ordering it back yeah. to, to where it need to be. There's a certain amount of contingency factored in there. But one thing that has been a little different in, the, in recent time, and that's where I was kind of going with the answer, was with the unpredictability of the market, certain additional forgivenesses have been seen in some contracts. I do believe our contract uh, outside uh, estimate for the project takes into account a good enough amount of that that you should be relatively safe within that budget. But again, it, this is not a predictable thing. Estimates are done as estimates. They're not, you know, it's not like I can tell you, you know, you got a, a house of X square feet and, <coughs> it and, and do it like you, you do it in a residential project. There are so many components to this. Uh, you probably all have seen the documents. It's two thick volumes of drawings and a couple of big thick specs, and there's a lot to the job. Thank so you. there's a lot to see. Thank you, Madam Chair. Certainly. Um, so I think you get the, the basis of what we're trying to do. The actual construction costs in the end will be de determined when you bid the project. We're hopeful that that will be actually lower than the estimate. I mean, it's, as the market continues to try to settle, it has been very unsettled, but as it continues to try to settle, we're hopeful that that will be a, a positive process going forward. Um, I do think you've got some other mitigating factors in, in place as well. One thing that um, the town has worked hard on and, and your team has worked really hard on is getting proper funding in place. And I think the good news is you've got some good additional funding aspects that are coming into play here that will help you, including um, you know, several million dollars worth of specialized funding and, and principal forgiveness that are going to come down the road. So that even though the project of $33.5 is a, is a lot of money, um, your local costs are somewhere around ten million dollars lower than that, which is which is a nice forgiveness factor that goes with that. So, um, again, in summary, it's it's hard to put your finger on some of these changes, and it's it sometimes can be challenging to do um, an accurate estimate when you don't know what the market condition is going to be, you don't know which contract is going to bid, and what, how those contractors are going to perceive your project as far as favorability. But what we can say categorically is that you have a project cost that's higher. We're very comfortable that it's higher. And we're also very comfortable that that increase has not been a result of a change in the scope. And I think that that's the nature of the letter that we put in front of you. Questions from the board? Mr. Patterson. Yeah, two questions. When do you anticipate this project will actually start? So assuming all the approvals go forward, um, the design is pretty close to complete. It's, it's been done, brought to the point where we could do final cost estimates. So you could bid it. Um, it does take you know, somewhere around 90 days to go through the process of getting the advertisements out once it's ready to go, um, getting the sub bids in, getting those to the final bidders, getting the general bids in, and then bringing it back to the town for a final award. Um, after that, subject to whichever contractor gets it and how they see it, the amount of time to break ground would be fairly subjective. But I would say you could, you know, within whenever you approve the final town, and, and I don't know, maybe the manager knows when you expect to have the final town meeting money in place. Um, April. April. So, yeah. so at, and, and it's, is it going to be able to be spent immediately? Yes. Yeah. So if that's the case, then I would say somewhere around four to five months after April would be the early time you'd, get, you'd probably have a contract in place. Okay. And my second question is really, you, you paired back the contingency from, what was it, 20 to 25 percent back to yeah. 10 percent? That's actually, that's actually normal. Um, in fact, the SRF program for the, that's your main financing mechanism for the state requires you to drop the contingency back after final design to 5 percent. Okay. Okay. What happens is when you have a preliminary estimate, you just don't know enough of those details and the design is kind of still a little undeveloped. 
so you tend to carry a much higher contingency. When the design is complete and you can actually do a pretty detailed line-by-line -line estimate, which is what our outside estimator has done, you actually don't need as great of a level of contingency. We have still had some built-in contingencies in some of the line item costs that are there because of unpredictability. So there's a little bit more forgiveness in some of those numbers than we, we might otherwise do if the market was fairly flat. But that contingency is an appropriate number at this point in time. So essentially what you're saying is that you, you're confident in the estimated today and assuming that things get started six months from now, let's say, well, seven months, within this, this calendar year, uh, the volatility of you know, our financial sy system here in the country and the inflation rate is not likely to shift significantly in that time period. And our contingency ought to be able to cover that. It, it was pretty wildly fluctuating over the past year and a half. Oh, yeah. Um, I would say at this point in time, it's a lot more calm than it was a year ago. Sure. However, certain factors have not come back into play. Um, there was a time when you could buy a certain piece of equipment, and a contractor would say, I need to buy a certain piece of capital equipment. They'd get a quote, and that quote was good for a couple of months or even six months sometimes. And the manufacturer knew they could honor that, that quote for that amount. Now we're still in the days when a lot of the manufacturers can't quote more than a couple of weeks. And that's the unpredictability of the market that the contractors are all faced with. So they have to take that risk and factor in how much of that to put in their bids. Um, that's getting better right now and certainly isn't as bad. And as you know, inflation is also starting to come under control, certainly compared to where it was last year um, in general. But predicting how that affects the market is still, it is still a little bit of a prediction. So um, we do our best to estimate what the market conditions would be and take, a, take account of those when the estimates are put. Yeah, it just makes me nervous when I see you cutting back on the contingency when yeah. the uncertainties on some of this are so high. Yeah, and they, but if you look, there's a reason there was a lot of contingency back then because the team knew when they put that contingency on there that they needed a lot of contingency. They didn't really know a lot of the details. Thank you. Mr. Brown? Yes, uh, are we required to use the subfiled bids? You absolutely are in Massachusetts. It's oh. for vertical construction work. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, chapter 149 of the Mass Laws for any vertical construction work is, is required for this type of work. Across the board? You don't have, need to do it first. So, for instance, you'll do pipeline work, um, road work, those types of horizontal work can be bid under Chapter 30. Mm -hmm. uh, vertical work, buildings, um, treatment plants, pump stations, those types of things have to be bid under but, Chapter 149, which in this case, Depend upon the size of the job would trigger a file sub. It's a job of this size, absolutely. It's a trigger do dollar figure that triggers it. Yep. Okay. Any other Thank questions you. from the board? I just have two quick ones. One, um, can we get a copy of this presentation? Of course. That would be important. And will there be someone to answer partic these particular questions, certainly around scope and the increase of the money at town meeting? Um, so I'll talk to the wastewater superintendent about that and whether we want to ask uh, a representative of the owner's project manager to be at the town meeting. Okay. Uh, and maybe we can address it through precinct meetings. I just think we need to make sure that we, we put this information out there. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Patterson? I guess one unaddressed issue is that uh, Robbins Road uh, lift station there that would be needed to support that uh, mixed residential commercial overlay district. You know, there's the question of whether that lift is, at, that's not included in the scope of this. Okay, thank you. Anything else from the board? No, nope. thanks for uh, explaining that carefully. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Mr. Mr. Fennerin, would you like to come up? Anybody who goes anywhere or buys anything knows the price of everything's gone up. In um, introduce yourself. Oh, Mark Finneran. Thank uh, you. Grand Ave. Um, and, you know, for, due to COVID and supply chain and inflation and government economic idiocy, if you ask me. But, um, and for instance, in my case, I just bought some two-by-fours that were now $6.00. And they were close to $12 a short time ago. 
if the same thing happens to, you know, the pipe, the steel, the cement, is there any um, contingency or method in here for us to claw back some of that? I can respond to that. So, thank you, Mr. Finneran. Standard, you know, standard practice with any town meeting appropriation, of course, is that the town spends what we need to spend for the intended purpose, and anything that's not spent is um, depending on what the authorization is. So, in this case, we're talking about a borrowing authorization. <coughs> so, if the borrowing is not needed, the money is not borrowed to begin with. And at some point, the town would rescind that borrowing authorization. And in fact, at this upcoming town meeting, we have a, an article to do just that. We have a series of borrowing authorizations that were not fully used that we are rescinding. Thank you. Madam Chair, what about the contractual prices? I'm sorry. I'm going to go to Mr. Zielinski, then Mr. Patterson. And if you have another question, Mr. Finneran will certainly entertain it. What about the contractual prices that are set in stone that they plan for contingency and they and, and prices come way down? Like just just that was described by Mr. Finner. And what happens to that? I mean, we we go out for a competitive bid and then once a contract is awarded, we're bound by those prices. So in the event that we went out and we have all these con uh, these contingencies in here and, and the bid is is high and over the course of the months before it starts, all the prices come way down. Just that's the price of doing business or, or timing. That, There's no way to recover that. That's correct. That's correct. And and there, you know the risk runs both ways, right? That's why you know you do a competitive bid, well, and the bids come in, and if the prices go up after that, that's on the contractor. That's not the town's. I've never heard, but I've never heard of a project going being stopped because they were making too much money or too much profit. It's always been we can't continue because it becomes unaffordable. To continue the project so I've never once in my career heard of anybody complaining about how much profit was in it correct mr. Patterson actually that was just in my question so this is not a reimbursable contract where basically the owners project manager is tracking the work being done and the material costs coming through and that has to be validated before we actually pay the contractor a check or the money I'll let the OPM elaborate we call that time and material in the trades, though. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a good discussion, and, and, and it would be nice if contractors work that way, where you could say, hey, if it's a little more money, we'll pay you a little bit more, and if it's a little less money, we'd pay you a little less. But as your manager has told you, once this gets bid, you'll sign a fixed cost amount for the contract. I have been involved in instances where we've known that things got substantial, things changed substantially in a reduction in cost and we sought credits. Um, we've usually done that through a process called value engineering with the contractor and the contractor, if you save money, is usually entitled to a portion of those savings as additional profit anyways. But it's not impossible to recover some significant savings if there is something substantial that changes. But remember that the nature of the materials in this project are pretty heavy cost capital equipment and heavy building materials. It's unlikely at this point in time that they're going to fall drastically um, in over the course of certainly a year and a half construction period when the contract is going to try to procure those. So it's thought process wise, it's a it's a completely valid thought process to go into, but from an actual practical standpoint, we don't find it occurring on projects very often. And it's, it's, it's not an unreasonable approach because, as um, your manager has said, the contractor takes a risk for the possible inflation of costs, too, which he usually factors into the equation. The best protection against that is to get more bids, get more bidders, have more people interested in bidding the project, get higher competition, and then the contractors all come in with a little sharper price. And they take a little bit of their risk money off because they see the attractiveness of a project of this size for their comp company to bid and make a profit on. That's the thing we wish we could control a little bit more, and that's what obviously we'll hope for when we get the bids is you'll get a number of competitive bids. Was your question answered? Mr. Zelensky rephrased it, and the answer was no. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Brown? Is, do you see any more opportunities to value engineer this project before it goes back out to bid? So, as you saw on one of the prior slides, we, we did already talk that through with, with the project team. Um, it's, we've been through it a little bit. 
Um, I think, and we've circled back around with the project team enough times that I think it's, it's pretty close to the project that you need and you can't do without really any more pieces. Mm -hmm. To save a significant amount of money, you have to cut a significant amount of scope. And that's one of the main parts of this is the project was never really fat to begin with. It's not like you had extra pieces that you just didn't need in the original vision. It, you need to build the expansion of the plant in order to treat the flow. And you've got to meet the permit that you anticipate having. So you can't, really can't cut facilities back. So. And one last question. If I yes. Could. The um, reduction in the odor control capacity, is that going to be a problem later? Are we going to have to do more work at a higher cost? So they're adjusting that now. Um, I mean, they've adjusted that now in the contract to a point where I believe, that, and this is on the design engineer more than the owner's project manager. We just handle the management pieces. But according to what we've heard from the design engineer, they feel confident that that's the right approach, right? And it's a long-term? Uh, it should work for you, yeah. I mean, every time, if you have to go back in the future and do another big expansion of the plant, you'll probably have to do a little bit more then. But for this expansion, this is the right number. I guess my question is, are, are we value and engineering stuff out that's going to need to be put back in later? Yeah. This is pretty permanent. Yeah, and most of the things that have actually been done to mitigate the costs haven't necessarily taken them out. They just found a different way to do them. So the town is doing some stuff with your, with your own forces. That's one of the things that we've tried to do significantly is make good decisions, things that the contractor might charge you extra for, but you could do ahead of time some of the demo things. and some other pre-construction work. Those things, if you can do those, you use your own forces and you try to save a little bit of money on them. Unfortunately, mostly, they're not the type of things that could save you millions of dollars. I was mostly so. concerned with the odor control just because it, there are houses nearby. Yeah. I, I will say that the town's project team, the designer, obviously our folks, and um, the sewer superintendent take the issue of odor control very seriously, and I, I know they've thought a lot about the approach here being the right approach. Okay, so. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board? Would anyone like to make a motion? And you do have a written motion in your packet. I'll do that. Once, excuse me, once yeah. you're looking for something to, once you're looking for something for um, precincts and all of that, would that preclude us taking a vote right now? Would that? No. Okay. What I'm looking for is information for the precincts. Okay. For I'm example, I would like to have their um, Weston and Sampson's um, their presentation because we don't have it in here because these questions are going to come up at precinct meetings and I'd like to have them be able available. to explain them. Absolutely. Thank but you. I do not believe it precludes a motion. Not at all. In fact, this is remember this is all about applying to the Division of Local Services for authority to. Um, proceed with this project without a, a second ballot vote. Definitely. That's what okay. that's what you're doing tonight. Because we're not asking voters to come up with more money specifically, but we're going to adjust our own budget. Is that the reason behind that? So it's um, you're you're in the right direction. So th there are remember two steps in the process. There's town at town meeting we are asking for more money, right? We're going to town meeting to appropriate an additional nine and a half million dollars. Now that's all for the same project that was voted by town meeting at 24 million, but then at the ballot vote by state law, the ballot vote when you authorize a debt exemption does not have a dollar amount attached um, because this type of thing happens frequently where the cost of a <clears throat> large capital project, you know, goes up after the, after the original vote on the election ballot to exclude the debt for that project. So, we know we need to go back to town meeting for the authority to expend an additional nine and a half million. And the question is, do, is a second ballot vote needed given that what was voted by on the ballot the first time was to exempt the debt for this project without a dollar amount. And, and this is the same project that was, that was conceived and thought of. The scope is what you've heard today, again, is the scope of that project has not changed. So is there a need to go back to the voters for that same exact vote to say exempt the debt for that project? And because the scope hasn't changed, technically we may not need to go back to the ballot. Had the scope changed, we would have to. Correct. Am I correct? <coughs> okay. Okay. 
I guess another way of looking at it, you know, last April when we voted the original debt exclusion, did we know about the reimbursement that we were going to get from the state and, uh, and some of this other money, yeah. which is basically, you know, offsetting the cost to the citizens? Yeah, the ARPA money, so, you know, maybe two and a half million or so was not known at that time. That's an ancillary benefit. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to make a motion. I move that we vote to accept the owner's project manager's report on cost of wastewater treatment facility improvements, uh, wastewater facility improvements project, and authorize application to a division of local services for determination of whether a second referendum is required due to the increase in cost for the wastewater treatment facility improvements project. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Okay, we will move into the consent agenda. Uh, approve Falmouth Fire and Rescue Department application for FY 2022 Emergency Management Planning Grant, EMPG. That is all, all that is on our consent agenda, and if no one's holding it, I'll accept a motion. So moved. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we will move on to the minutes. The public session, January 23rd, 2023. Any corrections? Yes, sir. Go ahead, right. Mr. Patterson. Yeah, uh, on page three, I still have the question about the numbering of the articles because uh, Article 15 is a petitioner's article and it indicates Articles 16 through 19. Right. We, um, Diane did review that and there was a change in the article numbering, so this was the numbering at that time. Okay. Great. Anything else, Mr. Patterson? Nope. Well, with that, I would uh, move that we approve the minutes of Monday, January 23rd, 2023. Second. And that we release it for public access. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any other discussion among the board? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And I will uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.